Hi there, I'm Sky, uh, and I'll be talking about the Chesapeake Bay SAV Watchers and sort of running through what the program was, what we developed with it, and how we'll implement that, basically. So, now, you might be wondering, what is the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay SAV Watcher? That's a good question, Bill. Um, <laughs> it is a way for us to outreach to citizen scientists around the Chesapeake Bay and get a more uniform data set for research, for development, because right now we have a bunch of people, citizens, volunteers, who want to collect this data, but they're all doing it in different ways, basically. So, through this program, we developed a monitoring protocol, data sheet, methods manual, a pocket sampling guide, and training videos, actually, as well, in order to help unify this data and get everybody on the same page. So first, we developed the monitoring protocol. This was meant to uh, allow people to gather the data better, to help understand it, and collect it. And from there, we turned it into two different tiers, because we knew that different moni monitors, uh, different volunteers, they weren't exactly going to be on the same scientific level. They weren't going to have the same understanding. So we put it into two different tiers. Tier one was more simplified. It was about just figuring out what was the most abundant SAV in the area and simply putting in a photograph to a water reporter and making sure that we got the data that way. Simple, to the point, get it done. Then from there, we had tier two, which as you can see, had a lot more to it, from SAV density to figuring out epiphytes, marine debris, and through that, then all getting it down on the data sheet that we developed. Uh, from here, there's a helpful guide. Everybody puts in everything. And then after that, they would turn it into their manager, whoever's running the program there. And then they would put it onto an online data sheet where all the data would be put together. Uh, we as well created a methods manual, giving people uh, much needed history to these programs, to the Chesapeake Bay, uh, information on different species, on the program itself, as well as helpful um, tips and simply how-to on each of the different protocols in each of the different tiers. Uh, and here you can see sort of a, to a example from those pages with uh, the SAV flower and seeds and then the SAV species as well with fun photos and methods and stuff like that, and pro tips. Moving on from there, we also developed a pocket guide. That way then it could fit right into your pocket. You'd take it with you to go. Within that was a plethora of information on species identification, who you can contact about that, a map of the Chesapeake Bay, always a good thing to have when you're out in the field so you don't get lost, um, what brings, what comes to the field and stuff like that and species list, as you can see here. Oh, whoops, I got it twice. The pocket guide itself had uh, the different, um, blanket on the name of it, thank you, salinity regimes. Salinity regimes, as well as uh, different information on the specifics uh, species and on the different plants and stuff like that. And there it is sort of finalized and it was categorized and it was helpful that way then people could better identify these. Um, and then from there, we also had instructional videos, which were great, which are all available on the UMSI's Ian YouTube page, which go into more specifics on the different things. And I actually have one of them, should be all ready to go and whatnot, or not. Well, well, uh oh. Well, that didn't work. So we're going to move on from that. My bad. Um, basically, the different videos had a narrator instructing people through the different processes. And when you access them on the YouTube page, they're much easier to watch than through a PowerPoint presentation. So that's a good thing. And then after this, we need to set up the finish developing the training and certification program to help better instruct people going out into the field with these resources, that way then we can get more uniform data. And thank you for taking your time to listen.
experience over the winter, there have been a number of press releases, short things uh, about uh, the improvement in SAVs. Is there a correspondence or a difference between your detailed information that you've gotten and the uh, you know, so short version that's print published? For yeah. right now, the program hasn't been totally set up. We're still in the stages of getting this out to the public. But it is awesome to hear all the news about SAV doing better in the most recent years. So we are very excited to see all the data coming in from this program in the future. And hopefully it just keeps getting better. I just have, it seems like there's been a couple projects that use the citizen scientists. Mm -hmm. When you develop these programs, do you direct them to any certain areas where you're trying to collect like a broad data set? Or do they just kind of go wherever they go and you conglomerate it together? Oh, right. Yeah. So that question was with all these different um, outreach programs, do they all just, do we organize them basically and send them to specific areas or do they just go wherever they want? Um, I'm not super qualified to answer that, unfortunately. But for the most part, I believe that it's sort of whoever we can get right now to volunteer. All we're asking is that, you know, for like the tier one people, they just go into their, you know, the creek, the stream, whatever's closest to them, and they get whatever they can. And then for the tier two people, we might have a better, we're still developing the outreach. We might send them to specific places. River keepers. Oh, yeah, the river keepers are often the, the place we target with. You know, this is to ground truth the satellite and airborne uh, sampling, because uh, you need eyes on the ground as well as what you see from the sky. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had seagrass appear, or what we saw are blobs on a map, on, a, on an aerial photo off of the Chesapeake Biological Lab in Solomon's Island. <clears throat> Last time it was seen there was 1972. It disappeared for 45 years. And, and we went out and, uh, and sent people out and called up and said, hey, can somebody go check that out? And they did. And in fact, we confirmed that there was reestablishment. Uh, so, so there's a combination of people that come and uh, go out and go wherever they're going to go, but we're trying to make the tools so that we can actually blanket the bay and, and start targeting areas that we that, that are either responsive, changing, or areas that we, we need confirmation on aerial or satellite photos. Uh, this might be more for Bill, but I'm just wondering if there's a tier three coming. Is there, I went on your website, I went on the site where there's actually lovely pictures of the citizens, uh, what the citizens saw mapped um, geographically, and uh, I saw some pictures of fish, but no identification, and I know you don't, that's not the point, but I was wondering if there's a tier three later coming, or four. So the question was if there's going to be a tier three, a tier four, let alone a tier five. Um, for now, no, and most likely in the future, no. We're just going to try and keep it to that tier one and two, keep it simple to that. But this is growing. The citizen science effort is growing. So you know, I'm not, I'm not, that's just for the SAV answer, yeah. but on a broader scale, I, I think we, we've, we, we just scratched the surface of what we could do. Anyway, we better move on. So thank you, yeah. Sky.